Let me begin first with a little game of word association, if I may. What's the first word that comes to your mind if I say intelligent? If it is this brain, then you're not alone, actually. So when the time came to build intelligent machines, that's where most engineers went. They flocked to emulate, simulate human behavior experience by building artificial neural networks. And these artificial neural networks have done wonders to our lives. If you have a driverless car, if you have other things like that, you're using these. Because this bio-inspired, which is inspired by biology, this artificial neural network has been able to take input, convert it into meaningful information. But it left out one part. It still hasn't been able to quite grasp human intuition, common sense, judgment, reasoning. And it sort of has reached that point where there's some stagnation now. The march of neural networks started with about 10, 10 neurons in it. And the neural network grew to about 20,000 quickly. And then further and further, we're 137 billion folks in that network. And yet, the question still looms, can we reach human capacity by 2025? That's 100 trillion. One problem, one thing stands in the way, though. That's called this unit. It's the unit of heat produced when you compute so, ma so much, so fast. And think about it, human, human behavior, Cognition, well, we use only 16.2, 16.3 billion neurons to do that. That's our cortical neuron capacity. And yet, although at the end of a very rough day, I do say that my brain is fried, we don't typically suddenly discover that working and cooking your dinner can be done on a melting away silicon chip. Because the truth is, there is no silicon chip which can compute 100 trillion um, worth of rapid speed unless we, unless we figure out that we might have, might have just misjudged what is intelligence. Is it about beating us humans at some game? Is it chess? Is it a video game? All of that? I don't know. What is intelligence? Is it about being able to speak more than 20 odd languages? Well, not really. Let me check. I asked this to Siri. Siri, will you help me get prepared for this TED talk? And... I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that. See, if I asked that to any one of you, you wouldn't have said that, would you? <laughs> so, what is it? I looked up the dictionary. Well, this is what it says. It is the ability to acquire knowledge and then to apply it to somehow sense and then respond to whatever it is that I'm seeing, feeling. And according to the smartest man that has ever been, apparently, it is the ability to change. Change by sensing, deciding, then acting or reacting to whatever it is that I've sensed, and then learning and quickly adapting sometimes even modifying the surrounding if I had to. And that is, in a sense, if, what is intelligence? So if that is the definition of intelligence, and turns out all AI researchers accept that as a definition of intelligence, I'm here today to tell you, think about it. Definition of intelligence is fully, fully seen in this single cell. This is a neutrophil in your body chasing that bacteria, knowing which turn to make as that thing tries to escape, following the cues released by that bacterial wall, and eventually it is successful. Look, it is successful in getting it, digesting it, taking it to its lysosome, the waste bin of a cell, and degrading it. And that neutrophil, that cell, uses an interconnected network inside, somehow to sense the cues, tell the different organelles inside to position itself, move, ruffle its membranes, find its way, use the mitochondrial bodies inside to generate ATP, which is the powerhouse of a cell, all along the way. 
how does it do that? And at the end of it, it uses this sort of a network, signaling network to do sensing, deciding, acting, but at the end of it, it learns and adapts using a gene regulatory network that tells it, remember that bug, it wasn't a good one then, it probably isn't a good one now if you get a reinfection. So I'm here to basically tell you cells, just any cell, any cell in your body is the beginning of natural intelligence. It senses things from outside world and then it decides, do I move, do I live, do I eat something around me that I don't like or do I die? And each one of you here, me, everybody, we all have about 37 trillion of them. They're all intelligent data processors. They're all interconnected in our body. Think about it, each just 20 micron in size and 37 trillion means it'll take you about 18.6 times around the globe. But what is it that differs between these cells? Doesn't matter who we are, all forms of organisms. We use them as our smallest units of data processing and communication. They could be short distance communication, like a cell spitting something into its environment and sensing it and reacting to it, or a molecular handshake between immunology cells that's contact dependent, or something like a paracrine signaling. Or if you have just had a meal, you probably have your pancreatic beta cells send out a hormone, insulin, all over your body, and then if you have those receptors for insulin, you'll see it. If you don't, tough luck, you're not going to see that signal. So that being it, a lot, a lot is known about cells talking to each other and how that may happen. But where we are really behind is how cells communicate within themselves. We know very little or next to nothing as to how this dynamic system works. Each little colored thing in that picture or the movie is a tiny little part inside a cell. A wiggling green mitochondria kissing the yellow web of uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Or the cyan colored lysosomes, which is the garbage disposal bag of the cell. But how do they communicate inside? Well, there are many theories. Some think it's like a cell phone. Signal in, signal out. But notice all those beautiful organelles are gone from that bag of water model. Uh, or some others would say it's just a fuzzball, hairy ball of networks. There are protein network, gene networks. Some say it's like a radio. You know what people in my lab and every other researcher probably has hanging in this win and at their window? Something like this. A tangled, hairy mess. And then we have to make sense of that. But we really don't have any clue, do we, as to how a cell would behave and react when perturbed. We just don't understand how these cells will react when you treat something, how it will escape that treatment, surely, sometime. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and then it will overcome whatever that treatment you were trying to give, and then there's death. And you know, uh, I, I, I'm sure here most of you, if not all of you, know of somebody or have had somebody close to you suffer from diseases like this, whether it is cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, so on and so forth, or autoimmune. It touched me personally very recently, and just less than two years back, I lost my mom to cancer. And that tumor cell kept coming back every time we thought we got it. So I, as a physician, a scientist, I felt like a fraud. I do research for a living. I see patients part of my day. And yet, I realized I'm one of those people who try fixing things without knowing what's broken. I'm just one of them. So no matter how much good intention funding can drive research, we still, we still can't overcome what Darwin has put together as what's the law of evolution. It is something that responds to change. Unless we know how it does, we don't know anything. So in this moment of sadness, 
feeling defeated, in a war that had the winners and losers picked well before me and my mom started their journey, in that moment of despair and death, I turned to life. I wanted to understand what does it mean as a signal transduction biologist? How would the cell work? Where can I get the clues? Those of you who don't know who, what that is, that is John Conway's game of life. In this game, these little things keep going on and on and on, and it's a complex dynamic system emerging constantly with new dots and new cells operating on just four mathematical rules. Just four rules. And if we figure out what those rules are, then we would know how do they emerge, how, how does the cell self-organize, how does it have robustness, flexibility to escape treatment, how does it even have vulnerability to get diseases to begin. This is where we came together as a big group of scientists working on one problem. And together we figured that it has an architecture, the cell's network that is, has an architecture not quite different from the internet. So this is how you and I think we exchange emails. Two Pillsbury Doughboys sending emails to each other. <laughs> but hidden from this view, simplistic view, is this architecture. There is, a, there is a layered architecture through which message goes from my laptop through those layers, through a key communication layer called network IP and transport layer, which is called TCP IP protocols. And then it goes out of the device cloud to your device. And it follows that path. And that is what we were able to see inside a cell. It wasn't a bag of water anymore. It actually had layered architecture. This allowed us to go ahead and see what kind of power would the knowledge of this architecture give us? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm married to somebody with about 18 years of experience in wireless communications. So when my laptop doesn't work, I simply say, honey, can you fix it for me? But for the rest of you, it's not so difficult now because you press a button, it takes care of the diagnostics, and problem solved. Turn on your Wi-Fi. That's what was probably off, or something else, <laughs> right? So knowing what is broken makes me a better fixer. And that should be no different. So having a knowledge of something that is, where is a device? Where is the application running? What's the communication layer? This helps us. And layering is the best way to break down complexity, make it simple. It makes sure we can divide and conquer something really big task like the internet or like communication inside cells. It gives independence to each modularity. It even shields and encapsulates any damage in one layer from the other layers. And it enables us to diagnose, troubleshoot. It helps standardize communications. So with that said, whatever the theory, seems like it should, it should fit this intranet of cell helps explain all those kinds of communication. Look, in the internet, there are all these types, not very different from the cell-cell communication. And then you have broadcast and multicast, which is like your hormones in the body, long distance communication. Even in this architecture, if you put several personal area networks, make a local area network. Several lands make a man. Several mans make the World Wide Web. Think about it, cell is the tiniest personal area network. You tie several cells, you get tissues, several tissues give you organs, several organs make us. You, each one of you here today, is a unique internet of interconnected cells. 37 trillion of them, they are processing their own way, the information. But our internet, much like rest of the actual World Wide Web, is also vulnerable to cyber attacks. We found examples of both domestic and foreign attacks. Uh, you can think of mutations being internal conflicts and foreign attacks being infectious diseases, drug overdose, so on and so forth. I know there are some of you out there, an analogy is okay, but it's taking too far. I know, I agree. In fact, we had to be very much grounded in foundational principles. You see, 
flipping wings didn't make Otto Lienthal uh, get much farther. That's actually his last flight before he crash landed. It wasn't until Bernoulli's principle, the fundamental principle of how lift can be achieved, did the Wright brothers set their wings uh, of dream. So similarly, we have taken fundamental principles and tried to get at finding how the cell works and why it behaves the way it behaves when perturbed. We are using a combination of novel mathematical tools, computational algorithms, and multiomics approach of looking at the two most important networks inside the cell. Remember one that allows sensing, deciding, acting, that is the signal transduction layer, and then the other network where the learning and adaptation happens over time as the cell changes its gene regulatory network responding to a situation. And because of our insights into what is the most important element in each of these networks and which of them are, matter the most, we actually have been able to create disease paths for diseases that have no cure at this time, like autoimmune disorders, like cancers. And we can map how the gene regulatory network changes so that the cell, the disease cell, learns along the way and escapes treatment. And because of our insights into what those changes are and what changes matter the most, we have been able to pick network resetting precise interventions, knowing what is it that's going to happen if we did something, with, which is full predictability. Now, because of this, we have been able to formulate rules, fundamental rules of therapeutics, the do's and don'ts that didn't exist so far in the clinic. Now, one more thing on the flip side, one thing is to make better the human lives and reduce suffering. We think we have the ability to impact artificial intelligence. The assumption here, and I hope all of you will agree, is that a cell must be more intelligent than any machine that is there. Why? Because the internet is just about four or five decades old. Compare that to a cell which has undergone billions of years of evolution. It's just better. And because it's better, biological switches that exist within the network is telling us the architecture of the network that the cell uses is way more complex. And we could learn something from it. For example, in the cell, we found three different layers of switches that go on and off, on and off in circle, triggering the next and the next. We can begin to ask, what possibly is it getting at that's better? Is it stability? Is it the ability to recognize signal over noise? Is it efficiency in the process, less energy consumption, error reduction, so on and so forth? So, in the end, we have to pick the kind of network we build. Well, which cells are smarter? It boils down to, well, pick the cell that looks closest to the kind of network we care to build. And in this case, these are the six competing interests of any cell. Competing objectives means you can never be good at any of those, all six of them at once, but only some at a time. A neuron is all about quality, dependability, and speed. But a cancer cell is better at reduced cost, efficiency, flexibility, and operating with intense innovation so that it can escape every kind of treatment. If you ever think that you want to outsmart a cell, we have to begin by thinking like a cell. And we have to appreciate just how intelligent these machines are. But at times, they may go rogue. And those times, in order for us to target them, precision can be achieved if we do understand and finally decode what makes them so intelligent. Thank you very much for your attention today. Have a good day.